everybody. My name is Grace, and today I'm going to continue the book, Who is Steven Spielberg? Chapter 4, Stevie Training Wheels. If Steven was nervous about directing an early episode of Night Gallery, the series of Spooky Half Hours show with two C surprise endings, he didn't show it. He even working with Joan Crawford, a movie star old enough to be his grandmother. Didn't seem to rattle him. He was all business on the set. He knew he had to be. A lot depended on his this first job. Stephen charmed Joan Crawford, who could behave like Cruella de Vil if she chose. And she delivered a great performance for him. The finished show was as, as scary as it's supposed to be. And it aired on schedule. Executives at Universal, Universal were happy. In no time at all, Stephen had a real office at the studio. A new convertible and a house of his own in Lauren Canyon. The one thing he didn't have was a green light or go ahead to make a full length feature film. Stephen directed many TV episodes and a handful of hour long made for TV movies. One of them called Duo was an eerie, nearly wordless theater that drew glowing reviews and was later released in European movie theaters. Critics praised Duo so highly that Stephen got it at least a dozen offers to direct feature films, as the is debut. But none of them interested him as much as a new story he had heard about a young Texas couple called The Dead. They were so desperate to get their son back from a foster home that they came outlaws, became outlaws. And dozens of police cars chased them from one end of Texas to the other. Stephen knew the story would make a great movie. He also knew that it would require a budget of $2.5 million. He managed to get Universal to pay for him to write a script about the death. But that was all. Meanwhile, Richard Danuk and David Brown, two talented producers, joined Universal and read the script. They wanted to make the film with Stephen directing and convinced the head of the studio to give Stephen's movie idea a green light. He began shooting the Sugar the Sugarland Express in January 1973. A few weeks after his 26th birthday, Zanuck and Brown were amazed how well the kid Handled the shoot. He directed the actors, city cars, and drivers, and many dangerous stunts like an old pro. Though few critics, cri- critics loved the Sugarland Express, audience didn't, and that was very disappointing to Stephen. He knew that if his next movie was a success, wasn't a success, his career might be over. Chapter 5, Shock Attack On a visit to Brown Zanuck's offices one day in 1973, Stephen noticed a copy of an unpublished novel on Zanuck's desk and read it over the weekend, called Jaws. It was about a killer shock that terrorizes a small resort town. It hooked Stephen right away. The producers agreed to him to let him direct a film version. He was thrilled, but not for long. The shoot was plagued with problems from day one. First, there was the location, Matthias Vineyard, a small island in Massachusetts. It's a popular summer resort. In a good weather, its waters are crowded with yachts, boats, with water skiers, and swimmers. Stephen couldn't show his shark hunters battling with a great white with tourists fishing on a boat, boat waving in the background. So almost every day, the crew had to wait for the ocean to clear. 
that took hours and hours of precious daylight. Then the schedule slowed down to a crawl. Then there was the weather. It was stormy. Sailors and tourists kept out of the water. But bad weather makes shooting on the ocean difficult, dangerous, and sometimes impossible. That meant more delays. And then there was the shark. The great white had to be huge, so huge and scary that audiences would scream when it appeared. No real great white could be trained for a film, and it was decades of before modern CGI. So a mechanical shark was made, weighing 12 tons. It had cold, staring eyes, big as teeth as big as carving knives, and the body of the self's the stretched limo. Steve named it Bruce, after his lawyer. During the very first camera test, Bruce broke apart and sank straight into the ocean floor. He had to be towed away for three weeks, worth re of repairs, disasters for film schedule and budget. Because so much was going wrong, the crew started the movie calling the movie flaws. The actors wanted to quit. There were rumblings at Universal about shutting down the movie. Sidney Schoenberg, who, who by then was president of Universal, promised Stephen his full support. Stephen vowed to finish the film, and he did. But even it was edited and set it to music, he worried that Jaws would flop. I was out of my mind with fear, he said later. At an early screening, during the first gush, gushsome shock attack, the man sitting next to him rushed out of the theater, gagging. He'd never come back, Stephen thought miserably. A few minutes later, the man did come back. He raced to his seat as if he couldn't stand to miss another second of the movie, after even throwing up. At that moment, Steve knew that Jaws would be a hit. It was when it was released in the summer of 1975. Critics were divided about Jaws. It was not about Bruce. He was one terrifying shark, and suddenly everybody wanted to see him. So, Universal tried something new. Instead of sending copies of the movie to a few theaters, which is what the studio usually did when the movie opened, Universal sent it to hundreds of theaters across the country, so everybody could see Bruce. The experiment worked. Jaws was a spectacular hit, the first ever summer blockbuster, earning with a whooping $260 million dollars and it also became the top grossing film in history. Already planning for another film, Stephen knew one thing for sure. My next picture, my next picture will be made on dry land, he said. There won't even be a bathroom scene. So that's all for today, and I will see you next time. Bye!